some of your own footage here? Um, no, this is no, this is not my footage. But this is uh, when Code Pink went to Gaza in June, May, June of '09, and to, to take in some uh, playground equipment. The playgrounds were destroyed, right? And one of the women, she's actually a Palestinian American who lives in um, New York, named Aruba. She put this together and sent it out to her group right after. And, uh, I just kind of play this at the beginning when people are coming in just to some Palestinian music. And, yeah. Is the feeling going? Yeah.
Okay, Sush. All right. This is my big moment. <laughs> big moment. <laughs> Don't be intimidated by the large crowd. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is Kit Kittridge, and I'm Susha Pratt, an old family friend. And um, Kit just sent me an email saying that she had some presentation she wanted to do and was going to be passing through Portland. And um, I come to this coffee shop all the time and knew it was a community space. So I put the two together and um, I am glad some folks that I don't recognize are here. And so I'm excited to learn about um, the activism that Kit has been doing in the Middle East. And um, she will tell more of her story. So I'm happy everyone's here. <laughs> activists with code pain, uh, Seattle Mid East Awareness Campaign, Ground Zero for Center for Nonviolence, uh, Veterans for Peace, and um, Stop the Checkpoints. And I've been to Gaza five times in the last three years uh, on peace delegations. And I was uh, in Tahrir Square last January during the revolution just by chance. Uh, I was taking a delegation to Gaza and uh, that was the, the date I chose and I ended up being there. And then I signed up for uh, two of the last ten flotillas that have gone to end the illegal siege of Gaza. And what brought me to being so impassioned and compelled to work uh, around the Palestinian uh, human rights issue uh, it basically, I'm sad to say it was only three years ago, but it was following Operation Cast Lead when Israel um, had a 22-day massacre uh, of the imprisoned state of, of Gaza and killed 1,400 people, mostly civilians. Over 500 of them were children, and um, most of the uh, armaments that were used are U.S.-made armaments. And I had no idea that Gaza is, was and is the imprisoned uh, camp that it is. And it's just, if for those of you that don't know, this is 25 miles by uh, 6 miles. There's 1.6 million people here. It's one of the most densely populated places on Earth. And it is basically the largest open-air prison camp on Earth as well because of the illegal, immoral blockade that the State of Israel imposes on it. They have no ingress and egress out of this except for a little bit through what's called the Rafa border crossing here. And that's been limited. You know, they'll say, oh, they've opened the crossing. But all that really truly means, and I spoke with somebody who came through last week, that only a few people can go through every day, a few meaning three or four hundred. No men can go through between ages 18 and 60 because they are considered to be dangerous uh, by the Israelis. Even though this is the Egyptian border, the Israeli has huge influence over it. Um, Egypt receives $2 billion a year of U.S. funds. Israel receives $3 billion in U.S. funds, and it's basically an arms deal. They are the two largest recipients um, in the world of U.S. funds, but it's, it's a military arms deal. Um, so our government is very complicit in this illegal and moral siege. It's breaking international law to have the siege and the blockade, but also to have uh, bombed uh, in, in the most barbaric way uh, the, the innocent population of Gaza. Um, the, the siege also includes in the, blo the uh, blockade three miles out. The boats cannot go out and get fish. They can only get the little fish that are left here, which is not much as we know from, from sea standards. And this is polluted because in that onslaught, that 22 day onslaught, the um, infrastructure of the, uh, all the sewage treatment plants were destroyed, uh, police stations, hospitals, most of the main infrastructure was destroyed. And so um, the water's polluted, people are getting extremely sick from the pollution, and they also are unable to farm on 22,000 acres because this is called the buffer zone by Israel, and they're shot if they go into this buffer zone. Um, I've, both, I've been in the boats out there, and I've also been um, on the farm land and been shot at. So, um, and that's happening all the time. People are being, there were some people killed last week just in the farm land. Uh, it's not in the news, but it happens regularly. So being an American citizen and feeling that my government and my tax dollars are very complicit in this 
absolutely immoral, horrific blockade and siege, I felt compelled to, to take action. And so with this, the peace group Code Pink that I'm involved in, uh, this was six weeks following the Operation Cast Lead, and we went to Gaza uh, over International Women's Day to support people of, of Palestine and Gaza and be there in solidarity, tell them that we had not forgotten and to bring out the stories uh, of the people and, and witness for ourselves. And this is at the border of Rafa, that's where we went to. We'd flown into Cairo, Egypt, and then went across at Rafa as, uh, after dealing with the Egyptian embassy. This is Colonel Ann Wright. She's uh, an amazing colonel who resigned in opposition to the Afghan war. Uh, goes around the country speaking uh, on all different peace issues. She's a Veterans for Peace. Medea Benjamin with Code Pink. And this is the Red Crescent. They also sponsored us going in. They're comparable to our Red Cross. And so they, they sponsored us along with the United Nations. Where is Red um, Crescent from? Red Crescent, they're basically um, Arab countries' Red Cross. Oh, OK. And they're all over. Yeah. And this is in Gaza. Um, children everywhere, 60% um, of the population is under 18. Did I already say that? 60% of the population is under 18. So there are main, uh, I'm going to go back to this one, I'm sorry. There are just zillions of children everywhere. And that's part of why so many children were killed in the, the uh, massacre, is because there you know, there's so many of them. Um, this is a hospital, a Shifa hospital. They destroyed or if they tried to destroy it, they did bomb uh, seven hospitals there. But parts of it are still, uh, were still functioning when we, when we arrived. Um, another uh, bombed out building here. There were more cars there than I realized. Uh, I thought that they wouldn't have had much gas because of the siege. But they do get, they were getting it through the tunnels and selling it in liter bottles. Um, I want, this jumps ahead, I apologize a little bit here. This is the graffiti and that we were told those are the names of the martyrs. The, most of the names are plastered all over the walls there. And there's some beautiful mural art all over in Gaza. Um, as I said, we were there for International Women's Day, so we went to 13, international, 13 different women's groups. And they were so moved that we just showed up to hear their stories. And um, they would tell us you know, over and over again, everybody lost uh, family members. They all basically had uh, PTSD. Um, one woman I met had nine children in December and three children in January, just three weeks later. And that was not an uncommon story. Um, uh, many of the children have epilepsy, are mute and deaf from Operation Castlet. Uh, all are very severely traumatized. One child that I held um, hadn't been able to go to sleep except in her mother's arms. And I was fortunate she put to sleep in my arms, but she'd just been so traumatized that she, she couldn't even sleep anymore. She was basically, um, you know, extremely fitful. This is um, what's called the Alcatan Children's Center. Uh, it's an oasis there for the children. Uh, luckily, it was not bombed. It's, it was amazing because every other building could be bombed there. One, you know, one block is totally demolished, the next block clean, same with all the different houses, one after the other. You never really knew it was very discriminate and indiscriminate both, because they targeted uh, uh, parliament building, they destroyed that, but then they would leave this, something like this. Um, this is uh, was set up by a, a wealthy um, London Palestinian, and he, you know, it's just a beautiful center that thousands and thousands of children go to. And that was uh, uh, Neem Abu, Abu Reem who runs that. And just a beautiful center that children can go to to kind of heal. It's like a healing center at this point in time. And it is still there. Uh, this is my host, the medic, in his home. Uh, we took a lot of different uh, banners like this. Code Pink has banners. and. Uh, he was proud to have him on his car and on his building. Many generations of people live in one building like this. It's deceiving on the outside, but on the inside of the, the typical concrete structure, there it's very colorful, well painted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, we'll do more research, but this.
sounds amazing. Please take your card. Yeah, take one of these. In a nutshell, we'll yeah. tell you what's absolutely wrong. Okay, yeah. thanks a lot. Thank thank you. Oh, you take one more card. <laughs> Just this one. This is a really good one. That's a great sight. If Americans yeah. knew, yeah. that's a really thank good you. one. Thank you, thank you very much. Drive safe. So you, know, you had grandparents and children, aunties and uncles, all in the same building, and, and very elaborately decorated uh, inside. Again, kids, 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 everywhere. They were so fun. They were so loving and wonderful. So excited to have somebody from the outside come because it's been under siege for so many years. Mm -hmm. um, and not that many people are able to go in. This is Jabaya. Uh, it's the oldest, largest refugee camp in the world. It uh, started in 1948 when the whole separation happened, right, when Israel was created. And that's, that's uh, the most densely, played, densely populated place in the world as well. It's only 1.4 kilometers and it has 110,000 people in it. It's just incredible. Um, I love that last picture too, the elderly man and his son of the three generations. And then this is just right next door. I mean, and, and Jabalia camp got hit particularly hard. It was, much of it was destroyed. Every day that I was there in this particular delegation march, 2009, I heard bombings still, every day. Um, at night, in the morning, uh, they were, it was ongoing. The U.S. made white phosphorus gas, Apache helicopters, F-16s, all were used. They would show us these canisters, you know. This is John Dean, he was head of the UN, and he, uh, like I said, they helped sponsor us there, so that we met with him. Again, more destruction. This is an area that was completely destroyed. I was told by the medic that they actually hung Palestinians from those poles. That was totally, you know, three, four, five story. They cleaned up a lot of the rubble. They, most of the Palestinians would camp right where their house had been. These are United Nations tents. Um, you know, there'd be 10, 20 people in that tent that would be staying there, clearing up the citrus groves, the olive groves that were just totally mowed down and, and destroyed. They're, they're incredible farmers, the Palestinians. I, I wanted to bring back some olive trees, but because there's no water, they destroyed the wells as well. They did, very deliberately did that. Um, uh, they said, don't bring olive trees because we don't have any water for them. I took some seeds and they were really happy with that. This is at the, uh, that blown up hospital, Al Shifa Hospital. And for International Women's Day, we were taking up those baskets there. And this is the children's center in that hospital. Um, and, and just down the hall here, that was right next to the children's center, also destroyed. And down the hall to the right, they were actually still using the hospital. There was an operation room down. Uh, so they were just making do with what they had. This was the American International School. Totally destroyed, no children luckily in it because John King had them leave. Uh, the playground is what compelled us to bring playgrounds the next trip. And this is a uh, picture of the tunnels that you hear about the tunnels. Um, it's kind of going on its own here. There are hundreds of tunnels right along that border. They're all over there on the left on Egypt, that Egyptian border. And most of the goods that go in are brought in through the tunnel. So it goes down about 35, 40 feet. I sat on a rope and went down in. And then uh, the air is very thin down there. And a lot of people die there. Um, Israel bombs the tunnels pretty regularly, both from uh, the sea and from the land. So there are many deaths there. Um, it's, it's one of the big employers, basically, in Gaza, is the tunnel industry. It's a big black market industry. It's, it's what they have to survive. Um, people of all ages work in there, elderly and, and little kids. Um, and um, basically, Israel likes to paint the picture that enough goods are coming in from this one little road down here on, on the south, southern corner there of Israel. And it is just a, a tenth of what is needed to survive there. So the rest is brought in through the tunnels. And that was my first trip, and I'm going to um, load up this, uh, this YouTube here. I don't, I don't know if I need to load it up either because um, I think it should be quick enough, yeah. So after
after that, I went to Gaza um, four more times. Uh, we went and we took in the uh, building equipment for the playground that you saw on the next trip. And then the following trip was when we were planning for the Gaza Freedom March, which is a huge international movement. Uh, we all met in Cairo, and um, they shut us down in Egypt. And they said, nope, we're shutting the border, you can't go in. And then they gave us two buses with 200 people that could go. Um, and that, that didn't work out so well because all the 1,100 people were left back in Cairo. But they actually joined in and just did some of their own actions from there. Yeah, we took in medical supplies. I took in medical supplies most every time. Um, I was working with acupuncturists there, um, and I was working with some uh, other therapists there as well. Um, so there have been 10 flotillas that have gone to Gaza. I'm just going to load this up here, make sure it goes. Um, and they started in 2008, and that was to end the, the naval blockade, uh, which is it was to break the siege, end the siege from, you know, the Mediterranean. And five of those uh, were successful. And the last three, you probably heard of the Mavi Marmara, which was a year and a half ago. And that one uh, was not successful and nine people were murdered on the high seas in international waters. One American actually was on that ship. So um, I was on the flotilla in July. And um, basically the, the tentacles of of Israel reached over to Greece and they said, Israel said, if you allow these flotillas to go, you will not receive any financial backing from us. And they're one of the main investors. So Greece, the Greece government, you know, crumpled and they didn't let us go. And that was the audacity of hope. That was the name of our ship. It was an American ship. 25% of the, on the ship were Jewish, 25% of the delegate and the passengers. Um, there's a huge number of Jewish Americans who are, who are working very fervently on Jewish Voices for Peace, you know, to end this illegal and moral siege. And so anyway, this is, this is a picture of uh, uh, footage, of the Al Jazeera footage of the last flotilla when I was in prison. I was in Israeli prison last month, actually. And um, there were two boats, the Searsha from Ireland and the uh, Canadian boat, the Tahrir, and to Turkey, and Turkey informed us that not all of us could go, only 12 could go on each boat, and I was chosen to go on the Canadian boat. And um, so that's what we did. It was November um, 3rd when we left, and we were able to get out of Turkey, and the Coast Guard didn't uh, intervene, and we were in international waters for two days, very glad that uh, we were not intercepted by Israel in the night time on the second, the second day and then on the morning. We were on totally on watch. You know, every half hour we get in touch with our uh, ground crew to let them know we were okay. And then on Friday I was on the phone with, with CNN in Tel Aviv and, they, and I said, well I see three Israeli warships. Uh, that's what's happening right now so we have about a half an hour before communications and the rest of the ships are there. And they said, well, call us when something else happens. And typical CNN, and they were off the line and incommunicado and not really, they were not one of the, uh, the networks that was on TV. We, on, on our boat, we had Al Jazeera, we had Democracy Now!, and we had Press TV. So kudos to them for wanting to be on our boat to document this illegal, uh, one, one more uh, illegal act by Israel, piracy, and, um, so this is your boat? That this is our video. boat. Yeah, this is our boat. And this is the footage that Al Jazeera took. Um, and then... When you were boarded in international waters. Boarded in international waters. international waters. So there were 27 of us. There were 17 Israeli warships. No weapons whatsoever. We are a civilian group on a ship. We have no weapons. We have no military presence. It's 
Our final destination is the betterment of mankind. Handles, water gunships, uh, zodiacs. Not about negotiating. I'm not negotiating. Not about negotiating. I am simply asking a question for clarity. Earlier this afternoon, you said we would be free to go our our, uh, our course after. That's our captain, George from Greece. We had an Australian, a Palestinian, three Canadian, and myself were the passengers on our ship. Can you please understand that it is safer if you come with a limited number of people and a limited number of arms, and you agree to allow us to continue our peaceful course after your inspection? I would also like to clarify that we do not consent to what is happening, we are not resisting, nor are we cooperating. We do not consider what you are about to tell us to be instructions. However, we are interested in your clarification of your intentions. Do you copy? So they told us to go to the bow, but they were water cannon. So there's no way we were we huddled behind the steering house there. Uh, two people were like up on the bow. This is the Irish boat, the Sirsha. The Fintan Sirsha, do you copy? Over. Are you able to update your situation? David Tahrir to Sirsha, over. search and deal with 25 of us, 27 of us, and then we were taken to Javan prison, and um, we were there between two and five days, some people. And that, those weren't peaceful boardings either? They were not peaceful boardings at all. They stormed the ship, they were very aggressive, they tasered, they um, uh, shoved, they had guns pointed at our heads constantly. I mean, they never took the guns away from being pointed at us. And it was a two or three hour trip back to Ashdod. So it wasn't, you know, we were, we were constantly, you know, and being harassed, humiliated, uh, told to shut up. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and basically the, the, the effect was to, to try to dehumanize. And, and the French vessel was badly damaged by a ram, was it not? Yeah, this was actually the Irish vessel, Irish and what happened, it was the um, Zodiacs went round and round the Sirsha, and it forced it to actually collide, and it had damage to the bow, and then it, I mean to the stern, and it took off, and the um, water cannons followed it and proceeded to blow out the windows on the side and fill it full of water. So if they hadn't had their, their auxiliary pumps kick in, they really would have, I mean, it was just like, not safe. Um, but no, it was very extremely aggressive and that never stopped. You know, it was, it, it was, that was a constant. And many, many lies. Uh, once we were taken to the prison, sign this, say that you entered illegally and we, you, we will let you go. No, some people did sign it, they that were not let, um, let go. Uh, they kept the men and women separate. They did lights, you know, they kept the lights on all the time. They tried to keep you awake at night by banging on the doors. They'd come in and wake you up three, four, five times a night to count three of us in a cell, three women in one cell and two in another. So, you know, it, it was... I have a question. What was on your boat you were taking? We were taking in $30,000 worth of medical supplies, but, but the real issue was the support of Palestine in ending the blockade. The naval blockade. It wasn't. It's not so much about trade. I mean, aid as it is 
opening up so that they have free trade, open trade, and liberty, freedom. And that's what it's about. So um, it really, uh, the aid would have been nice, but the Israelis, of course, now have confiscated it, stolen it, as well as our vote. Um, and we did not get that back. We all, there also was uh, about $30,000 worth of camera equipment from Democracy Now!, which they retained. Um, and my camera, uh, telephone, computer. So they basically have all of our equipment that was there. We did throw a lot of um, cameras and, and computers overboard, actually, so that they didn't get some of the information that was, that was on it. How did that footage get taken? And um, I, I was from the, uh, <clears throat> it was from the Al Jazeera uh, journalist. Somehow he got it out. We yeah, kept it. So we, I don't really know how. Um, he was with you though. Right? He was with us. That's the only way, I mean, I'm sure, because it is Al Jazeera footage. Yeah. So they did not search. Uh, Somehow he maybe put it in his mouth or his underwear. Or yeah. I mean, who knows? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, like send it off before it. Yeah. So um, we, you know, I, I came home, uh, but again, it is so nothing, just a little tiny taste of what the Palestinians experience day in and day out for years and years and years. So uh, you know, it's in no way comparable to that, but it, it definitely gave us a, a little. Uh, wait a minute, I want to do one more thing here. This is a, a poem that was read. It was written by Ehab, who was the Canadian who was speaking into the microphone at the beginning. It's called Silence. Silence raped the girl and slaughtered the Tutsis, murdered Malcolm X, supported apartheid, approved of the Holocaust, and flooded New Orleans. Silence stoned Muhammad, beheaded the Baptist, and crucified the Christ, burned a thousand forests, polluted the rivers, and abused the child, occupied Tibet, subjugated Ireland and stole Palestine. Silence your silence and fill the night with song. Your words are divine. That was by Ihab Latoya, and he was in cell 11, block 5, Jivan Prison, Ramla, November 8, 2011. Mm, cool. And he wrote that. He wrote song. that, yeah, and another poem here as well. I'll show it to you. This next poem um, is written by a Palestinian woman and it really speaks for itself. So. I'll start with this poem. I wrote this poem when the bombs were dropping on Gaza and I was the media spokesperson for the coalition uh, doing a lot of the organizing and we had stayed up to about six o'clock in the morning perfecting every sound bite and by the end, if you're Palestinian, you know most Palestinians get tired and start pronouncing our P's as B's. So we become Palestinians by the end of the day. So I was practicing my P's all night. And the next morning, uh, one of the journalists asked me, don't you think it would all be fine if you just stopped teaching your children to hate? Um, I did not insult the person. I was very polite, um, but I wrote this poem as a response to these types of questions we Palestinians always get. Today, my body was a TV'd massacre. Today, my body was a TV'd massacre that had to fit into sound bites and word limits. Today, my body was a TV'd massacre that had to fit into sound bites and word limits filled enough with statistics to counter measured response. And I perfected my English and I learned my UN resolutions. But still, he asked me, Miss Ziada, don't you think everything would be resolved if you would just stop teaching so much hatred to your children? Pause. I look inside of me for strength to be patient. But patience is not at the tip of my tongue as the bombs drop over Gaza. Patience has just escaped me. Pause. Smile. We teach life, sir. Rafif, remember to smile. Pause. We teach life, sir. We Palestinians teach life after they have occupied the last sky. We teach life after they have built their settlements and apartheid walls after the last skies. We teach life, sir. But today, my body was a TV'd massacre made to fit into sound bites and word limits. 
and just give us a story, a human story. You see, this is not political. We just want to tell people about you and your people. So give us a human story. Don't mention that word apartheid and occupation. This is not political. You have to help me as a journalist to help you tell your story, which is not a political story. Today, my body was a TV massacre. How about you give us the story of a woman in Gaza who needs medication? How about you? Do you have enough bone broken limbs to cover the sun, hand me over your dead and give me the list of their names in 1,200 word limits. Today, my body was a TV massacre made to fit into sound bites and word limits and move those that are desensitized to terrorist blood. But they felt sorry. They felt sorry for the cattle over Gaza. So I give them UN resolutions and statistics and we condemn and we deplore and we reject and these are not two equal sides, occupier and occupied, and a hundred dead, two hundred dead, and a thousand dead. And between that war crime and massacre, I vent out words and smile, not exotic. Smile, not terrorist. And I recount, I recount, a hundred dead, two hundred dead, a thousand dead. Is anyone out there? Will anyone listen? I wish I could wail over their bodies. I wish I could just run barefoot in every refugee camp and hold every child, cover their ears so they wouldn't have to hear the sound of bombing for the rest of their life the way I do. Today, my body was a TV massacre. And let me just tell you, there is nothing your UN resolutions have ever done about this. And no soundbite, no soundbite I come up with, no matter how good my English gets. No soundbite, no soundbite, no soundbite, no soundbite will bring them back to life. No soundbite will fix this. We teach life, sir. We teach life, sir. We Palestinians wake up every morning to teach the rest of the world life, sir. just with each human person, whether it's somebody coming in the door or somebody in the next block or somebody in the next state, that we all have human rights, justice, and freedom that are due. And if, if they're not there, if there's no justice, then there's no peace. And that it does begin just in our neighborhoods. And, and this particular incidence of Palestine to me is, is so profound because to me, it's blood on my hands, but it's if I'm not sharing this information with people in my neighborhood, with other Americans who are totally um, either unaware and who are all, we are all complicit because it is our tax dollars. It's, it's just what we need to be doing as responsible, conscientious citizens of the earth, really, citizens of the world. And um, so that's, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Hoping to, to that sharing this information, and and she, I mean this, she just is such an amazing poet, and obviously speaks so eloquently, um, and says it all in one poem. Really, uh, what I try to say with all these other words and pictures, but really it's about human rights violations, whether it's happening in our own neighborhood or across the ocean. We all are citizens of the world that need to take action, and it's it's time. You know. Democracy is not a spectator sport, and it's just time we all do whatever we can do in whatever capacity. And I'm such a believer in everybody having some capacity, whether it's letter writing or writing music or writing senators and getting up and standing out and occupying and just saying no to injustices all over the world. So thank you very much for coming. <laughs>